best and best of the stars of the morning shine on our darkness and lend us thine aid. Brightest and best of the stars of the morning shine on our darkness and lend us thine aid. Brightest and best of the stars of the morning, dawn on our darkness and lend us thine aid. Star of the east, the horizon adoring, guide where our infant redeemer is laid.
in-person worship. I know several of you are here for the first time, and we always review the protocols beginning at the service. We do ask you to keep your masks on the entire time. You're welcome to join in with the Lord's Prayer, um, but otherwise uh, we don't join in on the hymns or, or anything else. We do remain seated throughout the service, uh, and, and that includes through the postlude. And, and once the postlude is over, um, one of the ushers will come forward and just signal your row to, to leave. We do leave out the side aisles and then follow the signs for the direction to go out. Uh, if it's not raining, we're welcome to gather uh, outside and we do get to talk, talk a little bit depending on the weather and, and people's schedules. But again, welcome. It's good to see you all here and thank you for coming. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good things? 
that God has done for us. We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Let us worship God. fallen short of God's intended plan for us. Let us now pray together the prayer of confession. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses, and to deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Let us now continue to pray in silence.
Hear now the good news. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. God has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As the heaven is high above the earth, so great is God's mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, be glad, and welcome to holy worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Church, where whether we're near or far apart, we are bound together in the love of Jesus Christ. A special welcome to those of you here worshiping with us in person this morning. A special welcome to those of you worshiping virtually, watching this online. And as Patrick would always remember, a special welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us on the phone. We invite everyone to record your attendance, to make your offering, if you would like, on our church webpage. There you can register, sign in, uh, make an offering, fulfill a pledge, or even leave a prayer request if you wish. The flowers today have been dedicated by Gay Shrum in loving memory of her husband, Charles Rush. As you can tell by the elements that adore our communion table, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper later in today's service. And we invite all of you who are at home to gather bread and beverage of your choice so that we can remember and rejoice together in this sacrament as a faith community. Our opening hymn this morning reminded us that Magi from the East traveled afar to present their very best at the feet the Bay of Jesus. We too, now that it is our time of giving and of offering, should do the same. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you great thanks for the many blessings upon which you shower us, have showered us, and will continue to shower down upon us. May this church continue to utilize those gifts to spread your love throughout all of creation. Amen. Scripture reading today is taken from the third chapter of Ephesians, verses 1 through 12. This is the epistle reading for the day of Epiphany, which occurs uh, this week. Um, and it is a reading from a letter that may have been written by Paul or may have been written in his honor and in his voice by someone else. But it clearly um, exudes the joy that he has experienced and bears witness to with the unfolding revelation of God's love for all people and God's promise for all the nations of the world. Ephesians 3, 1 to 12. 
This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, that the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Although I am very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite all the children and the youth and the young at heart to gather around your television or your device for our children's moment this morning. As Pastor Larry just read, and as Ms. So and Dr. Ben just played and sang, today we are celebrating and observing Epiphany. Christmas, the season of Christmas has how many days? Twelve, right? And the Magi brought three gifts, right? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. But the Gospel of Matthew only tells us that Magi from the East came. It doesn't say how many, it doesn't say their gender or genders, but during this children's moment, I'd like us to focus not on the individual traits, the gifts, where they came from, who they were, but what they did together. Those magi traveled afar and didn't let anything stop them from worshiping Jesus. Astrologers, wise, sage people, they, they saw a star in the east and decided to follow it. It would not be a short journey. It would be a long and tedious one. That did not stop them. They had different ideas about what to bring. Perhaps they bickered, hey, my myrrh is so much better than your frankincense. We don't know. But together they brought their best. And those different ideas didn't stop them. When they finally got close to their final destination, they met Herod. And Herod did his best to not let them see Jesus, or even to experience the Jesus that they had traveled so far to see. Not let anyone else worship Jesus. They even had to go home via a different road. But that did not deter the Magi. It's important for us today to remember that worship is not as easy as it used to be. It certainly is a little different, right? We might not be able to be here in this space. We might not be able to see our friends. We might have to worship at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because 11 just doesn't work for us live. But just like those magi, that should not stop us from worshiping Jesus. The wisest in all of antiquity did not allow anything to stop them from worshiping Jesus. And neither should we. Let us pray. Loving God, for this gift, your love, 
And for this gift, your word, we give you such thanks. Continue to bless us this time as we celebrate Christmas and Epiphany. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Richard Niebuhr once wrote that Revelation allows for interpretation of every occasion in the life of people. As we begin a new year, we ask, O oh God, for revelation and interpretation of every event in our lives. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. When I was a child, one of the books I remember around our house was entitled The God That Failed. Some of you may have known this book. It provided firsthand accounts of six leading intellectuals of the 1940s, including Arthur Kessler and Richard Wright, who were initially involved in communism, but who became disillusioned and abandoned it as it became more and more brutal, particularly under Stalin. Now, I didn't read the book as a child. It's not much of a children's book. But later in high school, I was assigned one of its essays, and it's at that point that I remembered seeing the book around the house. It is a, it is a story of people who truly changed their minds about something major in history, about a system that had become a god to them and had failed and led them to look somewhere else for what is good and right and beautiful and just for the human creature. This week I received a newsletter from the history department of the University of Arkansas from which I graduated in 1976. Since 1981, the College of Arts and Sciences in that university has borne the name of the former United States Senator J. William Fulbright. The description of the college and of its name reads as follows. J. William Fulbright was a University of Arkansas student who graduated in 1925 and later became a law professor and then president of the university from 1939 to 1941, all prior to serving as a United States senator for many years. The university recognizes that Fulbright's political leg legacy is controversial and complex. Along with signing the Southern Manifesto and opposing the landmark 1954 ruling of Brown versus Board of Education, Fulbright voted to filibuster the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and voted against the 1965 Voting Rights Act. These actions directly contradicted his efforts to advance cultural understanding, peace, and international exchange through education. J. William Fulbright supported the creation of the United Nations, and his efforts to increase mutual understanding between people and nations resulted in the creation of the Fulbright Program, the world's largest international educational exchange program with more than 370,000 alumni and thousands of students and scholars from 160 countries who participate annually. The website then went on to say, 
It is his work to enhance cultural understanding, peace, and international exchange through education that we honor, along with his service to this institution as president. How we view past leaders is an important topic. And many colleges and universities are grappling with what is right while working to understand the complete history of those involved and what we can learn from the process. There's no better place to have this discussion than a college campus where we value conversation, learning, and debate. I noticed in the newsletter that a very young professor who was new to his teaching career when I was an undergraduate has gone on to become a biographer of both Fulbright and of President Lyndon Johnson, and he is rightly involved in this effort to determine change. Finally, as I indicated around Christmas, I've been rereading Marilyn Robinson's 2004 novel, Gilead, in which John Ames, a third generation minister in the fictional town of Gilead, Iowa, writes a memoir that he hopes his young son will read when the boy becomes older. Because Ames is 76, and his son is only seven, he believes that he will pass away before his son becomes an adult. Ames relates a time when his own father, who was also a minister in Gilead, tried to convince him to leave their small town for the larger, wider world. His father had said, we have lived within the limits of notions that were very old and even very local. I want you to understand that you do not have to be loyal to them all of the time. But the young Ames had replied to his father, the Lord absolutely transcends any understanding I have of him, which makes loyalty to him a different thing from loyalty to whatever customs or doctrines or memories that I associate with him. The younger Ames stayed in Gilead. He inherited the congregation from his father, and he preached there for over 50 years. During his ministry, he sought to see the hand of God, sometimes in, sometimes above, and sometimes in opposition to changes that were occurring in American society between the two world wars as reflected in the lives of his parishioners. I need not remind you of how much our world has continued to change since the period that John Ames was narrating. Women received the vote in our country only shortly after World War I. And while at least in the Presbyterian Church, even into the 1950s, it was rare and in some instances forbidden for women to serve as elders or deacons, let alone as ministers. Among some congregations in the Deep South, it was disallowed for black people to be admitted to worship, better yet to become members of the church. And this had nothing to do with COVID. Late in the 1970s, a process began in the Presbyterian Church that 40 years later led to the acceptance of gay and lesbian elders, deacons, and ministers. And in the past decade, 
for the church to conduct same-sex marriages. And more recently, many families, businesses, school systems, and state legislatures wrestle with the request to recognize people by the gender with which they identify rather than the body with which they were born. There are few regions, institutions, enterprises, or even families which have not been touched by questions of war and peace, of race, of sexual identity, in terms of who is accepted and what is acceptable, no matter how the word acceptance is defined, and no matter who does the defining. If we take a long view of history, which I am inclined to do, we go back not just to the founding of America or the development of the Enlightened or the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire a few centuries after the birth of Christ to trace the impact of change in society and therefore on the church. If we start our review of the human race with the earliest chapters of Genesis, we see that God created the earth and all that was in it in a garden-like Eden. The fall of Adam and Eve disrupted this idyllic existence, and it was followed immediately by division, tension, violence, none of which seem to have taken leave from us since the fall. Into this fallen world, God chose and formed the people of Israel through Abraham and Sarah, that they would both receive God's blessing, but perhaps more importantly, be agents of passing that blessing on to all, underline all, the nations of the world. This call occurred, as best we can tell, around the year 1800 BCE, before Christ. And with the birth of Christ nearly 2,000 years later, God's attempt to reach all the nations of the world took on renewed meaning. A few de decades after Christ's death and resurrection, as reflected in our scripture lesson for today, the earliest generation of leaders of the church seek to bear witness to God's promise to all the nations of the world by sharing the good news and grace of Jesus Christ with Gentiles, people who were not a part of the Jewish covenant, people who were among the nations of the world. In our passage, the writer of Ephesians marvels at both the power and beauty of God who through Christ is reaching out to and including within his promise these formerly excluded Gentiles. The letter is written in the voice of the Apostle Paul. It brims with joy and energy and gratitude and excitement that reflects Paul at his best. This is the reason that I, Paul, am, in a, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. In this passage, Paul is depicted as joyful and grateful as we ever see him in all of his writings or in all of the writings that have been attributed to him. What inspires Paul is what he describes earlier in the book as a mystery, God's plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. 
Paul says that he has, is grateful that this grace was given to him to bring this particular good news to the Gentiles. Just as Reverend John Ames recognizes it is God who transcends any of the notions or memories or customs through which he has worshipped God, and just as he feels it is a privilege to be a part of some of those notions and memories changing under the active initiation of God, of some of them remaining the same, so also the writer of Ephesians feels privileged, privileged to be a part of God's activity as God works God's purposes out in history. Perhaps both Ames and the author of Ephesians could sing together a hymn from Ames's era, God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. Nearer and nearer draws the time, the time that shall surely be when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. God is working God's purposes out. God's blessing to all the nations of the world, to every human being, to you and to me. I sense and I hope and I'm almost ready to say I know that we are entering this new year with hope. Hope that the vaccines now released, released will prove to be as effective as their tests have shown. Hope that they will be distributed fairly and effectively and quicker than they are being distributed, but we still have hope. Hope that most people, the great majority of people, will come forward and receive these as gifts of healing, receiving them with confidence and with trust. Hope that that will lead us to return to much of life as we knew it before COVID-19, however many months that will likely take. I hope we enter this new year with hope, the hope which usually accompanies for at least a brief time a new administration. As divided and fractious as we are and are likely still to be. I hope we enter this new year with hope. The hope that we will during this upcoming year once again hear the singing of choirs. Once again ourselves touch and partake and ingest and feel and be nourished by the serving of bread and wine as it is passed to us or as we come forward to receive it. As we enter this new year, I hope that we're able to resume and renew in-person friendships, family relationships, student-teacher relationships, visits to and from grandparents, to see newborn children. I hope we are able to find or resume love and marriage. As we go through the changes that such hope can bring, we will face questions in nearly every sector of life together about what customs, doctrines, memories, secular or sacred, we will bring into the new present and what to leave behind. We'll rightly ask how frequently will we need to go to an office to work? How frequently will we need to go to a classroom to teach or learn? How frequently will we need to go to a courtroom for a hearing? How frequently will we need to join others in a sanctuary for worship, prayer, singing, and life together as a congregation of the people of God. 
we will continue as a nation and as a church to ask how to bear witness to the reality that God's promises extend to and include all the nations of the world. We will ask with renewed intentionality and vigor what structures and laws and customs and traditions and norms and rules will need to be retired and which will need to be added to bear witness to and live into the reality given to Abraham and Sarah and confirmed by Jesus Christ and borne witness to by the writer of Ephesians, namely that all the nations of the world are worthy of our attention, that all people in the world are worthy of our attention because they receive God's attention. But as we step into this new year, celebrating it, if for no other reason than 2020 is over, what a time to recognize and remember that God is working God's purpose out and that we are privileged to be a part of it. We don't initiate it. We don't control it. We don't determine its outcome. We just join it joyfully. As Ames says near the end of his memoir, as he writes to his young son, there are a thousand, thousand reasons to live this life, every one of them sufficient. Welcome to 2021. There's a thousand, thousand reasons to think it will be a good year. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. Amen.
Presbyterian Church celebrates open communion, meaning that we welcome all baptized Christians to the table, regardless of denominational affiliation or church membership. We include children in our invitation. At Westminster, we welcome all people who are exploring or seeking faith to partake of the bread and of the wine that are before us. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. You sent to us your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save us. By his death on the cross, you revealed that your love has no limit. By raising him from the grave, you comfort us with the blessed hope of eternal life. By his victory, you assure us that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the heavenly chorus and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy. God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way and the truth and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, healed those who believed in him, received all who sought him, and lifted the burden of their sin. We glorify you for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new people by water and your spirit. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. 
as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us all, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and then he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do so in memory of me. And in the same manner after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this, do so, remembering me. Friends, worshiping virtually with us, I invite you now to partake of this foretaste of the heavenly banquet. For these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go out into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor every human being, loving and serving the Lord and rejoicing in the power of his spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of the Lord shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the countenance of the Lord be lifted upon you and give you peace. Amen.
coming. Kurt will now uh, point your way out and have a good week. Thank you.